All right, this morning I'm going to be preaching on the chapter of James 1. So I've decided just to sprinkle in amongst, you know, I usually do a lot of topical preaching, but I, I thought, you know, I really should do a lot more expository preaching as well. So what I've sort of decided to do, you know, until further notice, is I'm going to be like preaching through some books that I'm more familiar with um, and sprinkling in topical sermons in between those. So it also mixes it up a bit today. So I thought I'd preach through the book of James because James is a very practical book and there's a lot of great things in there. So we're starting off with James chapter 1 today. So we're going to go through James chapter 1, like Gersh read through this morning. So first of all, who was James? Who was James? There's a few different James in the Bible because there's, uh, you know, James brother of one of the disciples but also but most people believe that the person that wrote the epistle of James was actually the Lord's half-brother Jesus Christ's half-brother um, so we see here that Jesus Christ had a few half-brothers and sisters Galatians 1 <coughs> this is when Paul recounts going up to Jerusalem and talking with the apostles he says here, but other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Right? Mark 6, look at what uh, the people were saying to Jesus here. He says, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah? So this Judah here, a lot of people think is the Jude that wrote the book of uh, the epistle of Jude, uh, which is the second last book. And Jude even introduces himself as Jude, the brother of James. So we got the brother of James, they're talking about Jesus here, Joseph, and of course these are half brothers and sisters, not brothers and sisters, <coughs> because Jesus did not have an earthly father. And of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us, and they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honour, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. There's something interesting about James, the brother of the Lord, is that he did not actually believe Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ was walking on this earth right and he sort of alludes to it here that he's saying hey the prophet's not without honor save in his own country and among his own kin he's saying the people that know Jesus the best they're the ones that like, didn't really believe on him and if you remember when Jesus um, was starting to do things uh, his brethren said to him well why don't you go to the feast and tell everyone who you are because they're you know they're kind of mocking him saying like well if you're the you know you're the Messiah why don't you tell everyone who you are but, you know, obviously Jesus had other plans and his plan was not to just make it uh, known until his resurrection. You know, this is why even the, the devils that acknowledged him and said, you know, the son of, son of God, he, he told them to, to, to be silent, to, be, uh, to not share that. So that's something interesting about James. The other thing is, knowing that Jesus had half brothers and sisters, <coughs> that also tells us that the Catholic doctrine that teaches that Mary was a perpetual virgin was false, right? Because Jesus had half-brothers and sisters. Matthew 1, 24 says, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. So what does that mean? It means he did know her, and this knew her is a euphemism for obviously lying together. It's not just getting to know her. He knew her not till so until she had brought forth her firstborn son so that means after she brought forth her firstborn son which was jesus she had other children as well so mary was not a perpetual virgin and we're actually told the the, the names of the half brothers and sisters of jesus christ so that's a little bit about james now let's get into the chapter so james starts off with james a servant of god and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now we know who James is. And it's interesting that these passages, these, these epistles always start with a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I remember when we were discussing, there was a lot of discussion a few years ago about the Trinity and things like that. And a lot of people think that these, this, this, these passages that say, that refer to God and the Lord Jesus Christ are referring to the first and second person of the Trinity. But I don't think so. I think, because if it is, it always makes you wonder, why, why is the Holy Ghost never mentioned? 
You know what I mean? Like whenever it says God and the Lord Jesus Christ, like the Holy Spirit is like just always left out of these, these salutations. And, and I think the reason is because this is not actually referring to the first and second person of the Trinity. I think it's referring to God and the man, Christ Jesus. So this is why it's mentioning the two. And this is why the Holy Spirit is often left out of this salutation. But just a thought there. So that's what I think the emphasis is. Because even though the Lord Jesus Christ is God, and even though God is, you know, God and the Holy Spirit and, and the Word, um, there is that distinction there as well, which is the dual nature, where there's the divine nature and the human nature. And I think that's what's being alluded to here. So he's writing here to the 12 tribes, 12 tribes of Israel, which are scattered abroad greeting. <coughs> so this gives you an idea of the time in which this epistle is being written. And I think we can cross-reference this in Acts 8, because this same phrase, scattered abroad, is used. Acts 8. Acts 8 is when the church is now under persecution, right? This early church in the first century. It says that Saul was consenting unto his death. So this is the Apostle Paul, but he's named Saul at the time. So he was quite instrumental in a lot of this persecution. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So this is when I believe in James, when he's talking about the 12 tribes, when to the 12 tribes which are sc scattered abroad, it's during this time of persecution where the church is being persecuted and now the Jews are being scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. Verse 2, Acts 8, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial, made great lamentation over him. So if you remember, if you know your Bible well, Acts 7 is Stephen's sermon, <coughs> where he is actually stoned, and Saul is there consenting unto his death. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching. <coughs> <laughs> the word. So why did God scatter them? You know, a lot of people believe, and I agree with this, that, you know, in the early church, remember when Jesus said to them, he gave them the great commission to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. There'll be witnesses unto me both in Judea and in Jerusalem, you know, Jerusalem, Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. But what I, what I believe happened is that they didn't do this. Right? The church got comfortable being in Jerusalem, ministering amongst their own people. And what did God allow? God allowed persecution to come their way. And what was the result? See, that's why sometimes persecution is a good thing. You know, persecution, uh, you know, creates good results. You know, sometimes people always wonder, why does God allow suffering? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? And the, and the short of it is, it's because good can result from it. And God sees the bigger picture. And even here, when he's writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, they were scattered abroad. And what was the result of it? That's what actually started getting the gospel out and about. You know, so remember, they were just like trying to reach the Jews. And then, you know, Paul came in later and he was the apostle to the Gentiles. But here, they were scattered and that actually got the gospel being spread as well. <clears throat> so with that, that's why I think he goes into in James 1 verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Remember, because why were they scattered abroad? It was because of the persecution of the church. So now you can get a bit of context in what he's writing to them and to think what sort of per persecutions and temptations were what they were going under. So here, this is just an older spelling of diverse, right? So it's not diverse temptation. People, people make the joke sometimes. It's not like, you know, temptations on buying too much scuba gear and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so they're not falling into diverse temptations. They're falling into diverse temptations, right? It's just a, a different, an older spelling. And temptations, the word temptations in the Bible is, is sometimes used when, you know, it's lusts and things like that. But it's also trials as well. So these words are <coughs> interchangeable. Now the point, the good point to take away from this verse is, what is he saying here? He's saying, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, a phrase like this requires a lot of faith to believe because what is the natural response when you come under diverse temptation? It's not pleasant, is it? People get discouraged. 
people get down. People are naturally not joyful. Right? So this is why it requires faith. Right? Reading the word, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You see the word of God, you believe, hey, I should be joyful even when I go through hard times. Right? It reminds me of in Luke 6. Look at what Jesus says here. These are the part of the Beatitudes. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. I mean, this, this goes very well with what's happening you know, amongst the early church and why they're scattered abroad. Rejoice ye in that day. Look at this. And leap for joy. So if you didn't get the picture of how, you know, when, it, when the Bible says counted all joy, what sort of joy would you have? Well, Jesus is saying, well, you leap for joy. You leap for joy when you're being persecuted. In the name of Jesus Christ, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. So are you, are you joying because of the persecution? No, right, that's not the mindset. You're joying, why? Because your reward is great in heaven. Because when you, when you go through persecution, it's an opportunity to earn rewards. Right? It's an opportunity, like James is going to tell us about, that the trying of your faith, verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And remember, patience in the King James Bible is not just, it's not just working your ability to be able to wait for things. It's working patience, meaning your ability to go through and endure through hard times. That's what patience is. Now let patience... Right, so this patience, like I said, it's not just this waiting, not just this patient waiting like we would use the word today. It's this patience, this enduring through these temptations and the trying of your faith. Have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. <coughs> so it's not just this, is, is sadistic the right word? It's not just this idea that, oh, I know I'm hard and I just love like pain and I just love suffering. That's, that's not what you're counting on, joy, because... When you go through hard times, you know the good <coughs> that is going to come from it. That's what you're counting on joy. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Right? So it's having that faith to know that when we go through hard times, good things are going to come from it, whether it's rewards in heaven or whether it's our own growth in patience. Right? Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. It's a great verse. You know, one that I think everyone should have memorized. Right? Romans 8, 28. That all things work together for good. To them that love God. Right? So there is a condition there. Right? It's not just that all things work for good for everyone. Right? It's to them that love God. To them, that, to them who are called according to his purpose to his purpose. Look at Hebrews 2, 9. Look what it says about Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God shall taste death for every man. So this is the suffering that Christ went through. And he's our example. Verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So you know we talk about Jesus being perfect. Part of Jesus' perfection and him being perfect is the fact that he had to go through sufferings. Right? So we want to be like Jesus. You want to be made perfect like James is talking about. Let patience have her perfect work. Right? Then if we have that mindset, we may view temptations a bit differently and it will allow us in faith to have that joy that God is trying to encourage us to have here in James 1. Faith unwavering. All right, James 1. Let's go on to verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given. given. Saying if you, all of us lack wisdom, right? So it's funny how he says if any of you lack wisdom, as though there are people that do, don't lack wisdom. But, you know, maybe there are people that don't lack wisdom. Maybe Solomon is one of them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'd say this probably um, is relevant to, to most of us. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally. So this word has kind of changed meaning today, right? Where liberal, we think of like left-leaning and things like that. But it's about, he's giving to them freely. He's giving to them abundantly. 
right? Liberty, freedom. And upbraideth not. What does that mean? It means he doesn't tell you off. When somebody upbraids you, it means when you get told off. So this is saying that if you lack wisdom and you go to God and you ask for wisdom, you know, he'll give it to you and he won't tell you off for asking for it. Right? Which is a, it makes you reflect on you know, uh, you know, how, how we should be as Christians to other people and to, to our children. And it shall be given him. It reminds me of this parable when Jesus talks about praying. Uh, I'll just read through this parable because I think it's a good reminder for us. It says here, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So remember, this parable Jesus is giving here, he is giving us a lesson in how we are to pray. So think about this as you, as you, as you, as you hear this story. It's saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. So there's like a judge who's a corrupt judge. And there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying, avenge me of mine adversary. She wants justice from this judge. The judge is corrupt. He doesn't care about justice. And he would not for a while. So saying for, for, for a while, for a time, he doesn't care basically. He didn't do what she was requesting of the law to do. But afterward, he said within himself, though I fear not God, he's saying, I don't care what God thinks, and I don't care what man thinks, nor regard man, yet because this widow, verse 5, troubleth me. So it's like he's saying, this judge is a selfish reason for why he's going to fulfill this request, because she's bugging him. I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. <coughs> so this is what the unjust judge is saying. This is not saying this is God's attitude. This is just saying, look at what an unjust judge will do if you bug them enough. I mean, we use the word bug, but it's a negative connotation. You nag them enough, you ask repeatedly, right, enough, he's going to end up granting the request. And the Lord said, hear what the unjudged, unjust judge saith. Right, so he's saying, take heed to, like, this is what the unjust judge, unjust judge is doing. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? So there's a few different ways you can think of that, but, you know, one thing I think is, you know, maybe, you know, it's saying here that, you know, if we quote-unquote, nag God, the way this widow nagged this unjust judge, maybe our prayers would be answered. But then maybe when Jesus comes, nobody's asking God in faith of these things. You know, so there's nobody really asking God to do these things. Uh, obviously, there would be around the world, but I'm saying you can reflect on that in your personal life. So, this verse in James 1, if anything... If you don't know what to pray for, sometimes you say, I don't know what to pray for. Well, here's something you can pray for. Everyone can pray for wisdom. I always pray for wisdom. Wisdom is not just knowledge, you know. You can, have, you can know a lot of things, but wisdom is how to apply it. So that's why asking wisdom is not just, you know, knowing what the Bible says, because you can just read the Bible and know what the Bible says. You know, wisdom is about how to apply the Bible, and that, you know, that requires wisdom, and that's why we can ask God, you know, can we... Can we, how do we best apply your word? How do we best make decisions knowing what your word says? Because it's, as long as you, you know, and, and what I teach, you know, it's not always black and white. You know, there are convictions, there are, is wisdom that is required to make decisions. James 1.6, but, right? So there is a, a way we should ask. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. But let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now, <coughs> there's a couple of thoughts here with asking in faith. Now, all of us, to some extent, struggle with faith. And when I think about struggling with faith, I think of the father in Mark 9, verse 23, who was asking Jesus just to heal his son says to Jesus, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Well, that's, that's great. You know, but then he says here in verse 24, this is the father's response. And straightway the father, the child cried out 
And I, uh, you know, I definitely can relate to this father. Maybe you guys can too. He said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So all of us, to a certain extent, struggle to truly believe, you know, walk in the Spirit and believe the things that the Bible says. So that's one aspect of wavering, right? Is as we grow in our faith, we grow in our confidence in God's Word, we will believe more the things that God's Word says. But part of having a faith unwavering as well is actually knowing what the Bible says. You know, because sometimes people... Their faith is not based on always God's word or strongly on God's word. It's just based on what something has been taught to them or something that somebody else said. Maybe something you believe is not actually correct because you don't actually know it yourself. So part of having a faith unwavering is actually knowing what the Bible says so that when you ask something in faith, you ask something according to God's will, that you actually are asking something according to God's will and in faith according to God's word. Ephesians 4 verse 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So these are people that edify the church. But what is the purpose of edifying the church on top of your own Bible study and Bible reading? For the perfecting of the saints. Remember, patients have a perfect work. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the status and of the fullness of Christ. So as we learn God's word, look at this, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Doesn't that sound like, you know, a wave of the sea, carried and tossed, right? Because <coughs> that may be an aspect of why you ask with faith wavering, because you don't really know, is it God's will? Well, if you know the Bible, you know what the Bible says, you have more confidence that it's God's will because you're asking more in faith. Why? Verse 10, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we're not tossed about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cutting craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So just remember that faith isn't always just this feeling. Like, oh, you know, like, like people think of, uh, uh, what's it, Wizard of Oz? And, the, and she's got the red shoes. And she's like, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. And she's tapping her. Like, some people think faith is like that, where it's just like this mindless chanting of just like, oh, I just believe, believe, believe. Like, I just got to feel it. The burning in the bosom. That's not faith. Faith is like you know what God says and you believe it, right? That's why. Like, don't, don't always think that faith is like this nebulous thing. Like, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's just believing what God's Word says. Now, how can you believe what God's Word says if you don't know what God's Word says? And that's why Ephesians 4 talks about people's, people being tossed to and fro. All right, let's go on. James 1 9. Let the brother of low degrees, this is the point of the rich, brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. So he's talking about poor. <coughs> But the rich, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth away. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. So what's one of the main thoughts, I believe, in this passage is what it's talking about? Obviously, one thing it's talking about is... No matter what condition you're in, materialistically, we should still be able to rejoice, right? And the Bible talks about that in Hebrews 13. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So Hebrews 13 is saying that we always have Jesus. So no matter whether we have much or we have little material possessions, we can always be happy. We can always be content, right? That doesn't mean you can't have a drive to, to do more, but with the things that you have, you can be happy. And that's what James is getting at here. He's like, well, whether you're a brother of low degree, you can rejoice because one day you're going to be exalted because if you use the things that you have to serve God, there's going to be a great balancing at judgment day. And it's the same with the rich, right? That, that they're going to be humbled, <laughs> right? That they should rejoice in that so that they use their riches not for just pleasure in this life, 
but for serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what is he saying in verse 11? For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass. He's saying like time, time doesn't change. You know, so it's not the saying that time goes faster or time goes slower, but it says time doesn't change. So he's saying the sun's no sooner risen with a burning heat, but eventually all of us fade away, even the rich man and his riches. It's just saying, you know, one day life will be over and all the material riches in this world will be gone. Right? <coughs> this is why. So what he is also telling the brethren here to focus on is not on the material things, but the things of the spiritual things. Second Corinthians 4, 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Just a side note here on this verse. Um, I, just, I, just, I don't know if you guys find this story funny, but like this is a verse. I remember I went to a youth camp, and um, uh, this was a, the verse of uh, us, one of the groups within the youth camp. And then they, they put this song to, they put this verse to blessed assurance. And ever since they put that song, this verse of Blessed Assurance, I've like remembered this verse. And this is why when I'm thinking about doing the Bible memorization for the kids, is if we can put these verses to song, uh, that'll help them even more. So the way it went was, 2 Corinthians 4.18 While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So maybe you guys, maybe you guys will remember it too now. So I mean, that was from a youth camp like over a decade ago, and I still remember the verse to that song to this day. I just thought it was so good of them to put it to that song. Anyways, so back to James, focusing on the things that are eternal. That's what he's trying to get them to think about. All right? So let's go on to the next. Temptation. James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, one thing this verse tells us is, you know, we, we often talk about earning rewards and doing work for God. <coughs> And that obviously includes soul winning, getting people saved. But one thing to note here is, you know, when you endure temptation, that is rewarded also. Right? But when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So going back to, you know, counting it all joy when you endure temptations. Like I say, when, you, when, you, when, the, when your faith is tried and you overcome, this is one reason why you count it all joy. Like Jesus was saying, you count, you leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven because when you are tried for your faith, it's an opportunity to earn rewards, right? And if you have that eternal perspective, then you may look at temptations and trials in your life very differently. Now, one thing I want to say about temptation is overcoming temptation isn't just about willpower. You know, sometimes people think, oh, overcoming temptation, I just go like, don't do it. Don't. It's like, it's like uh, you know, you put something there and it's like, don't touch it. And you're like, don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it. You know, they think of temptation like that. Overcoming temptation. But that's not how I believe is the best way to overcome temptation. Look what it says here in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. So this is a encouraging thing in the Bible. The Bible is telling us here, when you have a temptation, there is nothing you will be tempted with that you can't overcome. Right? So when you feel, it's just it's too much for me. But, but how do you overcome it? He says that you're able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So, so one thing I, I'm always reminded of with this verse is the way sometimes we have to overcome temptation. It's not just this willpower to not do it, right? It's taking the escape. So I often think of overcoming temptation is that you replace bad habits with good habits, you know? For young men, you know, pornography is definitely one of those things, right? So it's not just about, oh, I just don't look at pornography. Well, you've got to replace your bad habits with good habits. Don't be idle. 
You know, don't just waste time on the computer. You know, do things in public so you're not alone. And that's one way you can overcome temptations like that. What about drugs? What about like smoking and drinking? You know, a lot of people in our church trying to give up smoking. Is it just you have, you, you bought the packet of cigarettes, you've got a budget for cigarettes, you've got them in the car and it's just like, oh, I'm just not going to smoke them, you know? No, you've got to replace bad habits with good habits. Use, maybe you're going to get that money not available. Don't hang around with smokers. You know, maybe you know, you're going to go to that party, there's going to be a bunch of smokers. You may say, you know what, I'm going to go hang around at a non-smoking event. You know, so you're going to replace bad habits with good habits. That is a better way to overcome temptation, right? James 1. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, but God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now, some people try and use this verse as a contradiction in the Bible. Genesis, well, they say, well, God doesn't tempt anyone, and then they go to Genesis 22, and it says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. So what is it? Does God not tempt anyone? Or does God tempt people because he tempted Abraham? He said unto him, Abraham, and he said, well, here am I. And that's when he's asking Abraham to sacrifice his son. Now, the verse actually says that I am te- let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So it's not that God doesn't tempt anyone, it's that God does not tempt anyone with evil. Now, to go a bit deeper, because this is what some of you think like me might be thinking, well, isn't sacrificing your son pretty evil? So isn't he getting Abraham to do evil? Well, no. So what Abraham was doing was not evil, and I'll explain why. Because when Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac, he believed that God was going to raise him up again. Why? Because Abraham knew the gospel, and he knew he was playing out the gospel. That's why it says in Hebrews eleven seventeen, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, tempted, <coughs> offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, right? Because he knew he was playing out the gospel of God giving his only begotten son, Jesus, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Look at this, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. (coughs) This is why you think part of the reason why was, you know, Abraham just so obedient, well, that's part of it. But part of it was because he, he, he believed, he believed, that when he was going to kill his son, sacrifice his son, that God would raise him again, and that would be a picture of the gospel. But God, obviously, at the end, didn't make him kill his son. He, he offered a ram, like a substitute. So he, he changed the picture. But this is why the Hebrews 11 explains why Abraham was able to go through it. And even when you go to Genesis 22, you see this in Abraham. Because look at what Abraham says to his servants that were with him, because he went with his son, Isaac, but also with servants. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, look at this, and come again to you. So even in Genesis 22, we see Abraham knew that he was going to come back with Isaac. So this is why he's not being tempted with evil. He's he's just being tempted. But James 1 is not saying God never tempts anyone. He's just saying God never tempts anyone with evil. James 1.14, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Now this this, uh, passage here, lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, excuse me, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now you notice, this is what Jesus said on the cross, and I believe this is what he was referring to. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, what is, he re- what is he referring to here? A lot of people say, oh, it is finished, meaning, oh, Jesus has done everything for us to be saved. Not true, right? Because he still had to rise again from the dead, right? He still had to go, his soul still had to go to hell. He still had to rise again from the dead. He still had to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. So how do we understand it is finished? Well, James 1 helps us understand it. What is he referring to when he says, it is finished, the death when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So that's why I you know, believe Jesus said, it is finished, when he died and gave up the ghost. So another thing we can take from James 1 as well, it says, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So this idea, you know, a lot of people, um, 
or say things, you know, when, they, when they're in sin or they're trying to overcome sin, they'll say things like, the devil made me do it, you know? But this verse is saying, it's not always the devil that's making you do it. Uh, like I said, the devil is not omnipresent like God. I mean, the devil's in one place at one time. Um, you know, you must be thinking quite highly of yourself to think that the devil is personally there making you do that one sin. Um, but that's not the case. Generally, our sins are from our own loss. We're drawn away of our own lusts and enticed. And that's how, how we sin. Let's go on. Good gifts. James 1.17. <coughs> Every good gift <coughs> and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable, and it's neither shadow of turning. Yeah, like Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So this can mean two things. It can either mean that all gifts that are good ultimately come from God, because sometimes we give gifts to other people. Or maybe it also means that physical gifts, like the gifts we give one another in this life, even though they may not you know, necessarily be bad, are not good in the sense that they're not perfect. Why? Because everything that we give on this earth is temp temporary. Right? All the physical things that we can give. So it's like when, when uh, the, remember the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why callest thou me good? Are we saying that there's no decent people in the world? Well, yeah, but are they good in terms of perfect? And that's why I wonder whether it says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Is it saying that every gift that we give one another is ultimately from God? Is that what it's saying? Or is it saying that the true gifts, the ones that are perfect, that are eternal, they all come from God, and that's true, like our rewards in heaven. But also salvation. I wouldn't say our rewards in heaven are gifts, but the ultimate gift, right, the ultimate gift that we get from God is what? Eternal life. Right? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And I think it's very important for us to remember that salvation, eternal life, is a gift. Right? It's not a reward. A lot, a lot of people get mixed up with these words. What is the difference between a reward and a gift? A reward is something you work for. Right? So when you work for God as a believer and you get to heaven and you're rewarded, right? you're rewarded because of the works that you did right? as a believer. But salvation is a gift. Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's a gift. Why is it a gift? Because we don't work for it. So eternal life is not a reward. Eternal life is a gift. So we don't work for it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. <coughs> for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is the ultimate perfect gift, the good gift from God, the gift of salvation. All we have to do to, to receive salvation, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's a gift, right? Because it's by grace through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. So God, somebody gives you a gift, and you have to do any work for it, it's no longer a gift. And we often use this analogy in soul winning. We'll say, well, if I give you, you know, my phone as a gift, but you have to pay me a dollar for it, that might be cheap, but that's not a gift. Right? A gift is when it's free. Who pays for the gift? The giver pays for the gift. What if I ask you to do some work? I give you a gift, but you have to clean my car. That's not a gift. You have to do what I say. That's not a gift. Well, that's the same with salvation. If you say, well, to receive salvation, you have to obey Jesus. Well, that's no longer a gift. You have to keep a commandment. You have to get baptized. You have to turn from your sin. That's no longer a gift. Now, are these things good to do? Of course. No. You know, good works would not be called good works if they weren't good. But salvation does not require good works. It's a gift. That's something to remember there. So when we think about every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, that is salvation as well. Now this ties in to the next couple of verses. The wrath of man. James 1.19 Wherefore, I was always taught, whenever you see the word wherefore in the Bible, 
you should ask the question, what is it there for? <laughs> so when he says wherefore, you ask, well, what is it there for? Well, because he's saying, look, salvation, right? Of his own will begat, he asked for the word of truth that we should be kind of first fruits of his creatures. Just because we're saved, that doesn't mean it's okay to live however you want. Now, if you lived however you want, would you still be saved? Yes. Does that mean it's the right thing to do? No. So that's why he's saying, wherefore, because you're saved, because you've got this perfect gift, his own will be out here. My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. So now he's encouraging good works. There's nothing wrong with that. So you don't want to get mixed up with doing good works for salvation, which is heresy, and encouraging good works as a believer, which is what every church should be doing. Right? But that doesn't mean if you don't do good works, you're not saved. So he's saying here, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man... So now he's encouraging some good behavior here, right? Because he's saying, look, if you're saved and you're a kind of first fruits of God's creature, you know, let's, let's encourage you and exhort you to act like a child of God because you are one, right? In, in the spiritual sense. My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. I won't spend too much time on these verses because we're a bit long in time. But, you know, we know these verses talk about, hey, you should hear before you speak too quickly, right? Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. <clears throat> Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So this verse is not saying you need to work in order to be saved. This verse is saying if you sin, grace will abound. But it's just saying, should you do that? No, you shouldn't do that because what should you do? You should not live like that any longer. That's what you should do, not that what you have to do to be saved. All right, so <clears throat> let's go back here. Yep, let's go on. Doers of the word. I won't spend too much time on this passage either because we're quite familiar with this. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So a glass like a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. For whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So a couple of things I just want to point out and I always like to point out when I go to this passage is why are you deceiving your own self if you are a hearer of the word and not a doer only? This is one thing I was telling the kids this morning. Because sometimes when people, they come to church, maybe you come to church every week, but you're not doing the things that you hear. Right? You're not obeying God. Why are you deceiving your own self? Because you may think that you're more spiritual than you are. You know, a lot of younger Christians, they think because they come to church, they have a lot of Bible knowledge, that that makes them spiritual. But what they don't know, or maybe what they don't realize yet, and what they need to realize is having knowledge does not make you spiritually mature. And I always like to go to this verse in 2 Peter 1. I think it, it outlines it so well. Look at, how, look, at the, look at the steps to spiritual growth. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So you start with faith and you add virtue. To virtue, knowledge. So knowledge is here at number three. <coughs> and to knowledge, temperance. Right, that's like discipline. To temperance, Patience, so that's enduring temptations like we talked about. <coughs> and, and to patience, godliness. So you see how cutting the sin out of your life is harder to do than just learning a bunch of stuff. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. Right? So this is loving your brother is harder than cutting the sin out of your life. It is something. And to brotherly kindness, Charity. So why, why is because charity is like loving people that don't even love you, like Jesus said. And if you love them that love you, what thank have you? Sinners do the same. So the ultimate goal is charity, right? And charity <laughs> is an action, isn't it? It's not a doctrinal position. So you can't arrive to charity is all you have is knowledge. And this is why if you are just a hearer of the word and not a doer. You're deceiving your own self. So he's saying, if you're a hearer of the word and not a doer, you're like somebody looking at themselves in the mirror. Because what is it? Because when you read God's word, you get a true picture of the nature of man. 
right? That's why it's looking at yourself in the mirror. You're seeing a true picture of yourself. You never don't do anything about it. It's like seeing you've got bad hair and you don't do anything about it, right? So that's why he's saying when you hear the word, you don't do it. You're like somebody that looks at themselves in the mirror. There's something to fix, but you just go away and you straightway forget what you look like. That's what he's talking about. So that's the last point I just want to make on this passage is, see, if you don't try and purposely do the things you learn, you're going to forget about them. So how many sermons have you heard? How many lessons have you learned over the years of being a Christian? And how much do you remember? The ones you're going to remember, the ones that you, you, you sort of, in your heart, you said, you know what, that was a good, I'm going to actually try and do something different in my life with that lesson. You know, whether it's a lesson about music, dress, reading your Bible, you know, having a different mindset with temptation. You know, you might go, you know what? You know, that really spoke to my heart this morning. Uh, you know, that, that bit in God's Word. You know what, next time when I go through a trial, I'm going to make it a point to try and be joyful about it. No, you know, this is my opportunity to, 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 to earn some rewards in heaven. I overcome this. You know, you do that, and this, this sermon is going to stick with you a lot more. All right, last one. I'm almost done. James 1.26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. That's, a, that's some pretty strong words there, right? This is, this is saying that, you know, you're, you're, the, way, the way you speak can make your religion vain. You know, you think, you think you're religious, but you can't control your own words. He's saying here, you deceive your own heart. This man's religion is vain. And if you can't control your mouth, that's how important your tongue is and the things you say. And he's saying here, you know, if you seem to be religious, but you won't bridle your tongue, you deceive your own heart. This man's religion is vain. It has, no, has, has less profit. This is why it's very important how we conduct ourselves. Part of that is how we talk. You know, we don't just want to talk like the world, filthy conversation and swear words and things like that. It may make your religion unprofitable, you know, and we, we know that because the way we behave, behave and the way we act can also have an impact on our testimony to others and our witness on others. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So a couple of thoughts on this verse and then we'll, we'll end in prayer. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say things like, they think religion is a, is a bad word. Now, I want you to know that religion is not a bad word. Religion is a good word in the Bible. And, you know, sometimes you'll hear, like, the modern Christians because they, they, they buy it, you know, they don't want to use the word religion because they don't think, they think it sounds bad. And then they'll say things like, I don't have a religion. Right there. I have a relationship. So relationship is like the new word. Now, is there, anything, is there anything wrong with that saying, yeah, because I'm not saying that having a relationship with Jesus Christ is a bad thing, but you have a religion. You know, the religion is the actual, there's nothing wrong with the word religion. But I think the reason why people don't like the word is because now religion is used to describe organizations, right? So they may not like, oh, they say organized religion, right? Which I don't know what they mean by disorganized religion. I don't want to be part of a disorganized religion. Um, so they say organized religion. Maybe they talk about large denominations and organizations. Or they refer to it as the rituals. So they're saying, but, we, but in Christianity, you're not meant to have mindless rituals anyway, right? So, yeah, if that's what they mean by it, that's probably why the word religion has a bad connotation. But in the Bible, what is religion? Religion really is the definition of charity, right? It's, it's looking after people and, and being loving. Look what it says. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, right? So it's loving people that need help. But it's not just that. Right? So it's not just all, you know, pure religion is not just about, it's not only being loving and doing charitable deeds, charitable social deeds, is it? Because he says, pure religion, undefiled before God and the Father is this. Visit, visit fathers and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Right? So part of being religious is about getting the sin out of your life, living a godly life. Jude says the same thing. And if some have compassion, making a difference. This is talking about salvation as well, preaching the gospel. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. 
So see, there's a few aspects to our religion, right? One is the good works, charitable works where we help others. Part of that is preaching the gospel. So it's not just about giving charity and giving money and food and clothes and things like that. It's also making sure we give them the gospel and they understand how to be saved. And that may require some fear, right? People understanding, hey, if you don't believe on Jesus Christ, there's, there's punishment to pay, pulling them out of the fire. But like Jude says, like James says, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. It's about living a godly life as well, isn't it? All right. Well, I hope you learned something there today. We're going to go to James 1. We'll do James chapter 2 next week, and maybe we'll do some topical sermons after that. All right, so I hope you really learned something there. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Uh, Lord, thank you for the reminders. I love the book of James. There's so much practical things we can put in our lives. Great reminders. Lord, help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Help us not to be forgetful hearers. I pray, Lord, that some of the lessons here today people will apply in their lives. So, Lord, help us. Help us to grow. Help us not just to be knowledgeable Christians, but help us to be charitable Christians. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.